Well, we're glad that you're still staying with us for the town hall session of the Monday Report. We are live from the Panari Hotel here in Nairobi. We carry on with our discussion how to curb money laundering and also what to do about uh, terror financing that is also closed within that same umbrella as well. And we're grateful for your feedback. 2242 is the SMS line. The hashtag is the Monday Report. Irene's uh, concierge is saying it's most important for Kenyans to know the source of campaign funds of their candidates. Thank you, Irene, for that. While Kipto is concerned, you say money laundering ranges wide, not only in on the political arena. Economically, money laundered, uh, or money that's been laundered has ended up uh, facilitating stores and other businesses mushrooming in every corner of the country. Sad that we don't have laws to look into this. One last one here, an SMS. You say a great topic to discuss at this point. It may not be looked at meticulously, but money laundering is injuring our economic structure. And even the strength of our currency in the global market depreciates because of this flooding. I believe there could be or there should be a contingency plan to have us secure the economic structure of this nation. You see, the per capita income is over 100,000, yet not every Kenyan lives over a dollar a day. The figure is obviously inflated because of few individuals with unreasonable amounts of money that is circulating in the economy. Kenyans are concerned this evening, and we want to get some insights and, uh, in terms of what can be done to get us out of this situation. Frederick Okado is still here with us, Program Officer with Muhuri. We have Abrahams Misoy, Programs Manager. Manager, Transparency International Kenya, and Hilary Onami, who's the Director of Public Policy and Research at ISPAC. Frederick, coming to you, before we took that break, we were discussing that 2010 report that was compiled by the uh, Financial Action Task Force. What did that report recommend in regards to the role of CSOs? Okay, I think um, what will come out clear of uh, this report uh, in September will be the implementation of Recommendation 8. Of the fat of the fat of recommendations, mm -hmm. which uh, touches on uh, civil society organisations um, and how government should uh, formulate laws and regulations that uh, govern uh, this institution. And I think the big gap that has been there is that uh, government has not really involved uh, civil society organisations in these processes. Remember, before the mutual review, the mutual evaluation review process is done. There's something called the national risk assessment process that is done by government agencies. A number of government agencies come together to do the national uh, um, risk assessment to the country and they look into the recommendation eight, which touches on a civil society organization. Now, when this process is done, ideally it is supposed to involve civil society organizations, but Kenya has not been involving civil society organizations, especially organizations that uh, are termed to be vocal organizations. So they will tend to go for organizations that are friendlier to them and put into the report that they involved civil society organizations. <laughs> but in real sense, uh, civil society organizations are never uh, involved in these processes. Um, since 2020, we've been trying to reach out to some of these uh, regulatory bodies, that is the FRC, the ARA, you know, the uh, NCTC, but in vain, because they are never um, ready to engage with, with, with uh, NPOs. And NPOs have a role and responsibility mm. to engage into these processes, the NRA processes, the mutual uh, evaluation review processes, as uh, big, um, you know, stakeholders in the um, money laundering and uh, countering of terrorism financing issues. Okay, thank yeah. you for putting that very clearly. Before I allow the audience to react, Hillary, uh, any other recommendations that you remember from that 2010 report that may concern you today? Well, the quite, I think I can say it's been a decade of uh, reforms in the anti money laundering uh, sector in Kenya. Uh, from uh, the uh, establishment of the anti money laundering advisory board in 2011 to the establishment of the financial re reporting center in 2012, uh, you know, establishment of the asset recovery agency in 2013, amendments of uh, the Companies Act to, to include the beneficial owners' uh, information in uh, 2015, and uh, it's been 2017 also we had an amendment to the Pokama Act to include uh, the, the non, um, uh, dis uh, <clears throat> designated uh, non-business um, entities and professionals. Um, it's been a decade of uh, reforms until uh, last year when um, 
uh, we did an amendment uh, again to include the lawyers and uh, and, and others in, com in in preparation for uh, the report. So essentially, it has been a decade of reforms, and that's why you're saying this could easily be eroded. Uh, you know, we are trying to strengthen the mechanisms and the institutional framework uh, to allow for the implementation of the uh, the, 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 the the recommendations thereof. And uh, if uh, we put in place uh, members of parliament that uh, are benefited, are beneficiaries of the, you know, anti, uh, the, the anti money laundering proceeds, uh, then uh, I doubt the next decade will um, will see uh, we will uh, erode easily the gains that we have gained in the last decade uh, if we have such caliber leaders in our, in our parliament in the next season. So I say it, it, I think we've been progressively. Uh, the, act, the, the issues about capacity building and strengthening our institutional frameworks to ensure that um, the proceeds of uh, um, money laundering are de de detected and you know they are, they are easily identified and uh, you will recover the, 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 the properties and assets that have been brought by those illicit uh, funds. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a work in progress that unless we strengthen the institutions, then whatever legal frameworks and, uh, that are very, um, they are very stringent uh, will be eroded as we go into the next decade. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. And before I allow Abrams now to give us some further insights, let's switch to our audience here, keenly waiting to ask their questions. I don't know where we'll begin. And as you ask your question, please introduce yourself, maybe where you come from, and then please fire your question or comment, and let's keep it brief. Uh, where do we have the microphone? Okay. It's, it's, can we quickly pass the microphone to this gentleman? I think he's ready to ask his question. Go ahead. Thank you. My name is Emmanuel Dalila, and uh, I stay in Nairobi. And I'm, under, I'm an entrepreneur. So I have three questions. My first question goes to Mr. Misoi. You see, we have this tendency as Kenyans or as human beings of saying we've put in structures. Will you kindly be uh, a bit clearer and tell us what kind of structures have been put? Because you see, saying we put structures will be a very clear way of responding to us. And then secondly, uh, I believe uh, Wahiga we have, uh, as Kenyans, uh, a very little impact in trying to prevent money laundering. The government has uh, the, bowl, the, bigger, the bigger part of the bull to do it. So, like my brother from uh, Mr. Wanami has just uh, put it clearer, that we have so many bodies that have been laid, he has talked about the recovery, the, the asset recovery, and many other bodies. So my mm. question is, do we have anyone, or has the asset recovery been able to recover anything, especially from these uh, big boys? Eh? Because I think some of these laws only apply to these young people. Mm. So as you tell us that you've made progress, could you please also be specific and mention a few people who you believe uh, Okay, be, be to the point and tell us that uh, it, we, the government was able, or maybe the asset recovery body was able to stop a specific money laundering activity that was going on, so that we also understand that there's progress. Okay. But from my side, as I stand, there's little, there's little or no progress. Thank you. Little or no progress. Okay, as they note that, let's, let's get a few more questions in. You want to ask yours? Okay. Yeah, yeah. I'm Henry Kibet Mwasa, Head of Star Communication from Starek Constituency. I represent uh, Amos Moago. Okay, about uh, lifestyle audit from the president. Has the, has the lifestyle audit pro been impacted for the elected leaders? Because it's been done on junior government officials. And then another question for the, Tash, the Turkish investor who was deported. Was any charges brought against him? Okay, we don't have the police here, or the, or the office of the DPP, so they may not be able to answer. Let's take one more here, then we get at some responses, then we'll get the microphone to the team at the back that also want to ask some questions. You may proceed. Okay, uh, uh, thank you so much, panelists, for this beautiful conversation. It's really eye-opening. Uh, my name is Dr. Juliet Kememia. I am a gubernatorial uh, candidate uh, Kambu County uh, under the ASMIO. Kano party, and uh, this topic of money laundering and 
the direct relationship it has with the, the, the politics, the, the politics of the day is very interesting for me because I am one person who doesn't have any money to campaign and uh, I would really like to know where where this this are this 40 is getting their money uh, my worry is um, about uh, institutional uh, capacity to deal with the money laundering uh, we are aware that there is uh, the asset recovery authority and um, i have i have i have tried to understand the mandate because uh, I've been working as a as a state officer, and at the beginning of year we are told to to declare our wealth. But uh, uh, the, the 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 following year we declare the wealth, but I have not seen uh, people who have amassed serious money in, in, within the year being arrested or or their assets being. Uh, are being recovered by the authority. So how strong mm -hmm. is uh, the asset recovery authority? Mm -hmm. And uh, can it, is it possible for, for, for whatever they have recovered to be put in the, in the public domain so that okay. it discourages uh, people who do money laundering? Okay, thank you. We'll pause there and get some reactions to my panelists. Please be brief. You can see there are more questions here and uh, time is uh, moving quite quickly. Abrahams, let's start with you, sir. Waika, thanks. I think I promised to give you uh, the outcome of the evaluation that was done way back in 2010. Mm -hmm. And uh, one in Kenya, Kenya was able to, to uh, comply or sort of uh, work on one of the recommendations. So it was only complying on one recommendation and largely compliant with another one and partially compliant with 15 of the recommendations and none compliant with 23 of them. Mm. So giving a total of 40. And among us, the, 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 the special recommendations now where we bringing in the CSOs, then nine of them, they were non-compliant with the nine of the special recommendations. So that tells you why we were gray listed, gray listed at that time. So your question, I think your question, my brother who is an entrepreneur and uh, Daktari who is um, vying for the position of governor in Kambu, and we, I wish you well, uh, they are more related because they speak about structures. My brother is talking about or asking about why are you talking to us about structures and systems? What are these systems? What are these structures? And I think uh, my brother Hilary has spoken about the structures, the ARA, Asset Recovery Authority. We have the FRC Financial, uh, uh, Financial Reporting Center. So these, are, these are the structures and institu institutions we are talking about. One thing we have to appreciate is they have already been established. The other question is now whether they have the capacity and they have the stamina, they have the strength and also the teeth to bite, as you, as you, you rightly put it, uh, Daktari. So these ones now, again, we're talking and grappling with. And that is what we are saying as an institution or NGO CSOs in this country. Why can't we be involved so that we, are also, we can support these institutions who doesn't have the capacity? When it comes in terms of, uh, say, they don't have information, then we can fill that gap assuming there are no resources to support these institutions. So how do we come in to perhaps support in terms of putting more capacity on the, uh, the, 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 the human resource within those institutions that have been created? So it is more or less a sort of the institutions are there, but the capacity is what we are looking at. Rightly put as, do they have the capacity to uh, uh, work on the mandate as, as, as put as stipulated in the laws or in the policies of the country. We are also talking about the policies. Remember, my brother here spoke about there was a rushed risk assessment that was done. Mm. So if that was rushed, what do you think about the outcome of that risk assessment that was done? Is it something that you're going to be tangible and can support in addressing the recommendations that were given as a country? Then that is another question. So for us, it will look at how is the process supposed to be? We need to have strong processes, structures that are able to do the mandate as, as stipulated in the law. I think that is what I can talk about. And this discussion, Waiga, has mm. come at the right time. 
uh, mentioning about the elections, mentioning about the voter bribery, last year we were able to do some sort of an, a survey, an analysis, and uh, in a report that we produced that we called My Leader, My Choice. And one of the things that was very stunning is Kenyans have that apathy. They've gone to a situation where they're resigning to their fate, unfortunately. And people are saying, whoever will bring me 50 shillings or 100 shillings, then I'll give my vote, which is very funny. And uh, is it where we want to go? Is it the kind of people that want to have 40% plus who mm. are doing this money laundering issues and using uh, proceeds of grime, a crime to, to sort of campaign and find their way into the office? Talk about the policies, which kind of policies and laws and legislations they are going to put in place for this country. So that's a question. That's a, okay. Thank you. And to Frederick from uh, Muhuri, I want to give you ample time to respond. So allow me to take a quick break here on the Monday Report, a very brief break. We come back, we get a few more questions because I know there's a whole group of people here that still want to uh, pose their questions in and then we get more responses from my panelists. And I'm loving some of the feedback that I'm seeing. Engineer Lazaro Kanyambok says, government shouldn't only work on asset recovery alone. We want these criminals arrested and made to face the law of the land. I think the engineer captures the anger of many Kenyans who are concerned about economic crimes today. Let's take a break. You're watching the Monday Report. Even as people campaign and, uh, and, uh, and, and sell their manifestos and so forth, the question of economic crimes and corruption in politicking, in the, in, in the electoral process, uh, and in business in general, is one that cannot be ignored. And we, we are making it a priority this evening here on the Monday Report. You're watching the Monday Report Town Hall Session live at the Panari Hotel here in Nairobi. Stay with us. We'll be right back.